The year is 87.039, new non-linear time. It's been 50,000 years since Stephen Zapata's final art stream, but we still live in a golden age defined by the gifts his stream bestowed upon mankind. Faster than light travel, eternal life, Stephen cloning, and the keys to a truly galactic human civilization. My name is Stave Satipaz, a reminder clone of Stephen Zapata an exact reproduction of his personality as constructed by an AI compiling millions of hours of his original art streams. By all accounts, I'm exactly like the original Steven's public persona, just more muscular, exactly as he would have wanted. I travel the stars on my light tracer, a dream of Steven. My crew is, of course, all clones of Steven. Some of my officers are reminders like me, but not all. Some are bio-clones, and yet others are aspectoids, clones who, instead of trying to capture his full essence, amplify a particular portion of the original Steven's personality. We've spent hundreds of years drawing, exploring, and philosophizing while snaking our way through the stars, spreading the good word of design. But we've had another secret mission as we've cruised the cosmos. We, I, seek information on the legendary originals Stephen Zapata's true drawings that he flung wide across the stars at the end of his life on Earth, never to be seen again. My crew thinks I'm looking for them for the same reason all the other madmen do, because they would be valuable beyond all reason. But they don't know what I know, that a critical mass of originals in the hands of a trained reminder can provide a psychic link to the original Stephen mind. Once I collect enough, I'll be able to fulfill my destiny and achieve psychological continuity with the original Stephen. And through me, he will live again to usher in golden ages of art forever. Drawing Ascendant, The Eternal Chronicles of Stephen Zapata. Lasting Legacy One, Epic One. All right, you know why you're here. Of course you do. You're here to talk art. You're here to make art. You're here to think about art. You're here to draw along. You're here to wonder. Wonder why you don't draw as much as you do. Or, if you're on the right side of things, you're wondering how it's possible that you do draw as much as you do. To all of you, whatever your current state, whatever your nature, whatever your philosophical inclinations, I say, welcome. Welcome to the stream. How long will we draw? Well, history shows that no one really knows. How long will we design? Also, no one really knows. How long will we ruminate? Think about what we're doing? How long will we philosophize? How long will we wax rhapsodic? Nobody knows. No one knows. Just like no one really knows how long they get to do anything. So enjoy it while you have the chance. Get to drawing get to being creative, get to having fun. Hi Sven, hi Emiliano, hi Eric, hi Reina, hey Felipe. down to the old American South. Seeing the bayou, seeing the swamps. Hey, Chady. Sean, how are you, sir? Good to see you all. Hope you're all drawing well, drawing happily and peacefully. I did not do a chatting section tonight because uh, I just couldn't help it. I wanted to draw. 
wanted to get back into this uh, sketch, a couple sketches that I did uh, this morning while streaming to the Patreon Discord, chatting with some of the patrons. Did uh, this one was very quick. This one is probably a half hour or less or something like that, and then spent the rest of the time getting more focused doing this design. Spent about four hours in there talking with everybody. And now that I have the idea, I'm just going to poke around on this a bit more, see what I find, maybe do another one. It was based on the, um, these are my photographs. I took these while I was down on my trip. I took these at the New Orleans Botanical Garden and uh, got inspired by these. There's a bunch more. I just picked a few that were particularly inspirational and that I remembered very fondly from my trip. And um, yeah, just basing a bit of a beastie on them. A little bit of a monster. Glad you like the music. Slowly adding to this creepy dark electro play mix that seems to be on vibe for about half the stuff we draw on stream. I gotta prune it more. It kinda falls apart at the end. Looks like Sai Orochi from One Punch Man. Uh, for the record, I've never seen anything. I've never consumed any media. I don't watch any movies, any television, play any video games, anything. Uh, I've never consumed a single thing, so if anything that I draw looks like something, uh, they stole it from me. They're all time travelers. They all looked at my legendary history-defining art streams in the distant future, came back in time, and used my designs to build their properties off of. Just like if you could go back in time right now, you'd like start the Beatles or invent the iPhone, right? Same thing, just everything that you're watching, everything that you're enjoying in popular culture right now, just time travelers using my designs after everything. Just for the record. Eric says, so I gotta ask you again, do you have a drawing class? Cause I really wanna take a class. I have seats open right now for my February mentorship. You can find the link in the description to this stream. If you want to learn with me, check that out. 
I think there's... Ooh, I forget the order. I think there's one seat left open for Wednesdays in February. And I think... <clears throat> yeah, I think there's one seat left open for Wednesdays, and I think there's four seats left open for Saturdays. If you go to my Gumroad, you can read the descriptions on there. They have uh, more information about what the class is, what I focus on, the kind of work I have people do. And uh, you can investigate. See if you think the tone will work for you. I'll tell you this, it gets weird, baby. have any tips to design angels and mythological things um, just get inspired by something else if you want to do something new if you want if you like what's old if um if you connect with the archetypes then don't mess with it like just keep doing the the thing that has always worked that you already enjoy but um if you want to do something new with them you need to be inspired by something else and as to how to do that, well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Yeah, that's a big question. That's asking how do you get good at design, you know? No, no other way to look at it. Steven, how's the design course coming along? Um, so far, it is the thing I am most proud of. The question is, how will I make it? It's a big production task, but the, the part that I have, the base ideas, the tone, the writing that I have, um, I'm very, very happy with the base idea. The trick is making it. The trick is making it. It will be difficult and time consuming. And I will need help. And uh, it will probably wind up being expensive. So. But uh, design deserves it. Design is not regular, not simple, not easily taught. That's why nobody teaches it. Design is a new way of seeing the world, an acid trip all its own. Revealing to you the weirdness of how you were already interacting with the world and seeing it and deciphering it. I think, unfortunately, if you're going to teach it, you have to honor that. You must invite in the weirdness.
What does a typical day in Steven's life look like? Why do you not consume any media? Thank you. I was kidding about that. I was just making fun of um, the thing in art that uh, no matter what you draw, no matter how strange it is, no matter how unique you think it is, if you're sharing it with an audience, it always reminds someone of something, right? And that's just a, a funny in-joke in art circles. Uh, so I was just making fun of that. I do consume media. I love movies and books and TV and video games. Um, typical day in my life, you know, if I'm, if it's a drawing heavy day, you're looking at it, you know, it's just this with either the camera on or off. And then if it's not this, who knows what else I'm doing? God, what else am I doing? I'm not drawing. I'm probably, uh, answering emails, thinking about drawing, writing about drawing, recording things, speaking with students. I spend a lot of time these days uh, doing my correspondence, you know, I get a... I accrue questions from students, current and old, over time, and uh, I just set aside blocks of the day to answer, answer, answer. And then besides that, you know... I'm sure my day looks a lot like yours. I relax, and I walk, I pet my dog, and I talk to my wife. I watch TV with her. I read. Occasionally I get to dance, that's nice. Sometimes I even go on vacation. What is the plant on the right called? Um, I don't know what it is called, what its particular species was, but this was in a display at the New Orleans Museum, at the New Orleans Botanical Garden called Living Fossils. So it was all plants that were like really old, like pre-dinosaur old, and this is a fern. So it's a lot, it's a lot like modern ferns um, that sort of fold up and then unfold in a day and night so cycle. It's like that, but yeah, I just took, I only put two photos here, but I took like 30 photos of this thing because I thought like, my God, that just looks like a perfect sublime alien tentacle, right? Doesn't that just look like a perfect Cthulhu tentacle or something like that? Cooler than anything you'd invent where it's like, it branches off symmetrically and each one becomes its own tentacle and then it has its own fractal tentacles coming off of each tentacle rad but yeah some kind of ancient fern i didn't take photos of any of the uh, display placards of any of these so i actually can't unfortunately i can't tell you what plant they actually are if my friend omar was in here he could probably identify a few, a few of them Hi, Boomy. 
world breaking amount of tentacles in one sentence. That's what we do here. That is what we do here. Steven, can you mail me a set of teeth? They don't have to be yours for art reasons? Yeah, just send me an email with your address, all your credit card numbers, make sure to add the three digits on the back, social security numbers. Just the basic info that I need to mail anything to you. Include uh, your favorite pet's name, your the model and make of your first car, and your mother's maiden name. They always ask me for that at the post office when I mail a fan something. Ah, my favorite thing in life, adjusting the curve on an arm. Steven, how do you convert the exaggerated figures of a comic artist like David Finch to a more naturalistic look? His drawing shows immense skill and draftsmanship, but I am not a fan of the comic -y look. I mean, you gotta soften. You just have to pick where you want to soften things. The, um, all of the shadow shapes that he puts everywhere. All right, give me a second. It comes down to this. It's like maybe Dave Finch draws something like this. Well, you know, he'll draw this better than I draw it, but this is the idea behind how he might draw something. So he's got this arm, and then he's got all of these really extreme comic booky shapes. Yeah. He's like, oh, look at me, Dave Finch. Oh, it just comes out of me, like, whatever. Oh, it's so rehearsed and so perfect that I can do it so effortlessly and everybody loves it. It's easy, but it's also, like, industry-defining. It's not just industry-defining, it's, like, life-defining for some people. Like, they see my drawings and it sets them down on a new course permanently, and all I have to do is just wing it out. And it really doesn't bother me, and I've done it a million times. People like to buy the originals at conventions, and I'm an inspiration to many including Steven Zapata, and it's really not a big deal for me because I'm Dave Finch. So it's covered in all these shapes, right? All these comic booky shapes.
Now, the thing is that, you know, a, a you know realistic painting of a muscular arm or something like that, those shapes might actually be in there, right? You know, if you design them well, not these badly sketched shapes, but the really refined like Dave Finch shapes, right? Um, those shapes might be in there. It's just that when you see it in a comic book context or in the context of Dave's work, all of these shapes all have the exact same contrast. That is to say that they are pure black against pure white, essentially, right? I know that he does pencils. The pencils are technically a gray against a white, but they're all trying to be basically the same tone. And a comic book is not playing with the tone differences between the value shapes. So all you theoretically need to do, right? There's always, it always a little bit more complicated than this. It always requires a little bit more dither, but all you theoretically need to do is add different contrasts between shape to shape. So you would say that, you know, these middle shapes, let's say the light is coming from up here, right? These middle shapes are now this dark gray instead of pure black. And these shapes that are most facing the light up here, they're a very, very light gray. And this starts adding naturalism, some immediate feeling of lighting. Uh, and if you add on to that softening of the shape, so it's not all razor sharp edges that are good for print, but there's a variety of medium edges, hard edges, and soft edges on the form, you're gonna very quickly start doing things very realistically. And um, you can get an idea for how powerful this is if you just throw some color underneath something like this. You just let the shapes do the drawing work for you. And then instead of going straight to black, all of the shapes are just a color, right? So now we put the dark flesh tone down in the darker part of the shapes, medium ones in those medium areas, and then the light tones are really only slightly darker than the base tone of the flesh. And that starts to give you a kind of realistic looking tone, right? And if I do something like this real quick and then do something like, let's do dust and scratches. Check it out. Not bad, yeah? Pretty quick, yes. Nice little base for rendering. Just do some subtle half tones here. So I'm just softening the edges. Add some bigger value transitions. What I like to think of as value ribbons, both horizontal and vertical value ribbons. And then just blast out some of the much too harsh stuff. Like I said earlier, the edges, right? Bit of group in with the airbrush. Contrast controlling layer. Hit it with a specular.
done. Like nothing. And just balance the colors because you cheated your way to the form, so the colors are always off. You gotta add a little bit more saturation in there and stuff like that, but that's the basic idea. That's how you get to something that's rendered from something that's like a Dave Finch drawing. Just remember that if you start super sharp, you've got to spend more time uh, softening. And if you start super soft, you have to spend more time sharpening. And it's that easy, baby. Went from David Finch to Steve Houston. <laughs> you got it. Now that's the power of understanding the elements of design. Line, value, form, shape, space, negative space. Once you understand those things, you can go from anything to any other thing, given enough time. Useful stuff for a designer. Not necessary for all artists. Most artists don't need to go all the way from one thing to another thing, right? Most artists just make a career off of doing one thing very well, but uh, I was trained as a designer. I love design, and uh, for a designer, it's very useful to be a chameleon who can adopt any look and fix any look, adjust any look, work to any look. So you need to understand the, uh, the elements very deeply. It's very difficult to do stuff like that if you're just copying the circuits you need to really understand what's going on. Hey Francesco, I'm good, how are you? What's the plug in between Coolerus and Layers? That is Layer Factory, you can find on Gumroad. I have a link to its page and the creator in my video description, I think? I'm pretty sure, it's usually in there. Even you read manga? Not really. Mostly I listen to audiobooks. Audiobooks dominate my consumption because uh, I can listen to them while I work. Comics are cool, but I've just never been able to get into them because um, 
they, um, well, you can't do anything else while you read them, right? You have to look at the pictures and read the words. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a creator and I have a stronger creative drive than I have a consumption drive. So I don't need to read a comic for very long before I'm just more interested in making something than I am in consuming something. So uh, a really, really good comic, the number one feeling it gives me is the desire to put it down. And I do. How old are you, Steven? I am 31. C&D, greetings from the Philippines, greetings from New York. BBQ Ted says, hey, Stephen, purchase your mentorship the other night. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you, BBQ Ted. That's exciting. I'm beyond excited, nervous. What the hell do I do till then? Well, uh, later, I believe it's this week, right? Later this week, you will receive, later this week, you will receive an email from me, from my workshop email, and um, that will have instructions um to spoiler it for you uh you're gonna give me well your contact info you're gonna give me uh links to work that you've done now i don't need that to be um i don't need that to be a portfolio right it can be but 
what I'm really interested in is whatever images explain to me where you're at with your art. So that can include your most successful pieces, but I think I find that a lot of people find it useful to show me pieces that were failures, where they felt that they sort of reached the limits of their abilities, or they couldn't push it any further, or the picture showed them that um, they really had sort of gone outside of their bounds. Basically points of frustration and breakage, right? So don't think of it as a portfolio. Think of it as what pieces explain where I'm at in the journey to a teacher best, right? Um, that's what you're going to give me. And you're also going to give me, to whatever extent you're comfortable, right? It can be as much or as little as you want, your art life story, basically. And um, I'm going to use that to sort of base my assessment of what you're interested in, where you're going, where you're headed, pitfalls to look out for, what you should think of in terms of projects and things like that. Um, the art life story can get quite long. I've had people send me many pages for their art life story and uh, unlike in art college or something like that, uh, I'll read every word you send me, you know? So um, as much as you're comfortable, uh, as much or as little as you're comfortable sharing such that it explains your journey in art so far. Uh, yes, that will be what I will collect from you. Uh, you can start working on that stuff now, start thinking about that stuff. Um, drawing wise, the only blanket advice I give mentorship and workshop students is um, just sketchbook, just do free sketchbooking and use it as a gateway to understand what's, um, what's upsetting you about your practice or just sharpens your self-assessment of like, this hurts, this doesn't, this feels good, this doesn't, this is a problem point, this isn't. Do the sketchbooking to, um, to give you a little bit of that. And then we'll take it from there. And then we just start talking via email and Discord before the workshop goes. And then, yeah, workshop is intense. February will be intense. Would my Instagram be okay? I could even just put together one post of my bad drawings, which is most all of it. Yeah, Instagram's fine. But um, if you don't want to do it in a public venue, you can just use imger.com to make a, um, you can use imger.com to make a, a gallery that you can send me. You can turn it into, a, you can make a PDF uh, and send it to me via email. You can make an art station, and I think you can set an art station to private and send it to me in an art station gallery. Someone wanted to see the other monster. That's the other one. I might start drawing another one in a bit. I kind of feel like sketching a lineup. Joseph, what's up, buddy? What is up? Do you ever dream of the things you draw? If only. Never. Sometimes if I'm under a lot of stress with workers, uh, especially back in school when I was in school, um, I would have a uh, Photoshop dreams though, where the whole dream is just, it's not me using the computer. It's, it's as if it was just a live stream of Photoshop. The dream is just Photoshop and me doing the work that I need to do in Photoshop. And those were the worst stress dreams because I would do the work in Photoshop and then when I wake up, the work was gone. I, I, I knew what needed to be done, but I had to do it again. <laughs> horrible, horrible dreams. I haven't had one of those in a long time. Thank goodness.
Can you tell us your story? How did you get into art? What were the challenges you faced while defining your career? It's wonderful to listen to you. Thanks for sharing. Well, I'm very glad that you are enjoying listening to me. Um, yeah, my story is... Well, I've said it in a lot of places. You know what? You know what you might want to check out? Um, instead of me redoing the story for a lot of people, let me um, point you to a podcast that I just did where I, where I was interviewed. Go check out that link to the Dark Art Society podcast. It's free to listen to on SoundCloud. The most recent episode is an interview with me. And um, I think that'll give you a uh, pretty good explanation of what my journey has been like. That podcast starts with me explaining how I got into art, you know, encountering it when I was young, uh, the journey that I went on to professional and sort of where my head's at these days. I think like uh, most artists, the undercurrent of my journey is that, my God, I love drawing, and I've ducked, weaved, searched, fought, white-knuckled, and gritted my way towards just what can I do in life to keep me drawing, and I've just based everything on that. And here I am, 31 years in, and I have not had to give up yet, so things are going well by my estimation. Yes, it is Photoshop. And yes, I have a few plugins, two plugins. But it's good old Photoshop. I do also use a uh, Clip Studio Paint and Procreate. Photoshop is definitely my comfort zone though, even though much of it frustrates me. Harry Potter house do you belong to? I don't know. I mean, based on solely on my art, it's probably Slytherin, but I probably act more like, um, 
I don't know. What would a uh, what house is the one for goofballs? Is it Hufflepuff? I'd probably be a Hufflepuff. I'd be a Hufflepuff who draws Slytherin art. I'm just going to put something in the chat. Does that go to the right place? Yeah. Just because you guys were mentioning Harry Potter. I just thought I'd post that link. I mean, I know that, um... You know, I'm cryptic a lot of the time about these things, but I just, you know, that image, it always just like, something about that image, it's like, you know how I'm always saying that a lot of the times for work, you do stuff that is not what you, not at all what people think you do and things like that. But a lot of the times because of NDAs and things like that, you can't ever admit that you did things. It's like, hypothetically, if I could admit to things, um, I would hypothetically be able to admit to doing that one for Harry Potter. For that studio tour. But, of course, I can't hypothetically admit. So I won't. Steven, have you ever used the Blackwing pencils? Are they worth the price? Yeah, I use them all over the channel. I use them all the time. Um, I mean, I like them. They're not for everybody. It depends whether you like to press really hard, if you like to press really soft. I mean, you just gotta try them out. I would just buy one. Any, it's really easy when you buy pencils and stuff like that to go crazy and um, and uh, buy a hundred of something that you just think you're gonna like, just buy one and try it out. One pencil lasts a long time, a surprisingly long time. I use them a lot, I like them. 
but if you're if you're a little bit more heavy-handed than me they probably wouldn't be for you because you'd be putting down dark darks maybe too often i really like those really buttery dark pencils because i'm light-handed naturally so they kind of like always make me go back add more darkness add more darkness add more darkness Just the, um, I work on an iMac, so just the iMac monitor, which is thick. It's a pretty sick monitor. It's 5K, I believe, E3. So it's like a, like an iPad color range, which is pretty, pretty good. Not that you get that all the time, because, uh, on an iPad, everything's P3, because it has to be, I think, in order to get into the app store or something like that. So it all looks really good. But um, just because the monitors got the widest gamut possible for commercial monitors or typical consumer monitors doesn't mean that uh, desktop apps are actually putting out those P3 colors. Hey Magda, what's up? What up? <laughs> oh, and someone else jumped in on the group drawing mentorship. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to have you. We're gonna have fun in February. It's gonna be a lot of drawing. Sorry, I just saw that pop up on my phone. need to render the living everything out of this though I would need to if I really wanted to wrap it up and present it nicely but I do want to go look at another design but I just don't want to I don't want to leave it behind until I've made the statement you know and to me well it's really up to you where the statement is made but um, you know a lot of people can stop when they feel like they can see the rest just in their head um, I've come not to trust that. I'm like, yeah, I thought I could see it in my head. And then once I start drawing what I thought was in my head, it turns out that uh, that was all an illusion. So I usually consider the statement made on a design like this when I just got 
from head to toe with some design consideration. So I've thought about design up here and all the way down here and everywhere in between. So it doesn't need to be rendered. The shapes don't need to be super refined, but instead of just an indication, I've just made some design statement that I think that I think fits head to toe, top to bottom. And then I can move on. It takes longer, of course, when you start in color because you have to include the color statements in that. It could go even faster if I just did this design in black and white, but I don't know. It's really hard to do certain designs without color, especially stuff that's based on plants, I think. You know, plants live so much on their color ranges and their color transitions that something like this. I was like, yeah, I should just start. So I'm just going to redo this guy. I want to redo this guy as a plant thing. So I want to, you know, succulent him up, add some plant shapes and stuff like that. So I could go back and do that in a bit, but maybe for now I will, um, yeah, I might as well look at a new idea and then if my new idea doesn't interests me, then I can go back to that first one and redo him planty. Oh, Magda, that's very kind. Thank you. That is very kind of you to share your story. IDK says, do you use any of the filter or photography part of Photoshop? Yeah, I use the adjustments all the time. Filters, less so. I use dust and scratches a lot. It, um, it's a good way to beat up a photo uh, really fast without losing the edges. I like dust and scratches. Use that one all the time. Not for this, not for painting, like for work and stuff like that, where you need to blend things together from photos and from painting. Dust and Scratches is really useful for that. I don't really use any filters when I'm just straight up painting. Your mentorship sounds interesting. Is it fair to say that you focus on the individual students and their goals, mindsets, instead of just art techniques? Uh, I say it in the description of the um, of the mentorship. If you go to the if you go to my Gumroad and you click into one of the days for February, I say it in there that we emphasize project-based work, and it's your project, right? It's me trying to keep you on target to do the stuff that you actually like to do instead of the stuff that you are hypnotizing yourself into thinking you have to do. So yeah, I'm pretty, I slide pretty hard into the individual students' uh, goals and what they're trying to get at. Um, I do push project-based personally, you know, if, uh, if someone wants me, if someone wants to convince me that it's more important for them that they just, um, focus on raw grinding skills or whatever, I will have a very serious conversation with them about why I think that is a horrible idea, but they're the student. So if they want it, I will do it. But uh, I really do push project-based work. I think it's what's best for most. Um, I think it's very important for beginners to at least get a download on how to do it and how to think that way. I focus on that. 
especially because once a student leaves me, um, they might not ever get another opportunity to have an experienced artist just ask them, what do you want to do? And then whatever they say, the artist will give them sort of good faith and feedback on that for a whole month. It's like, uh, yeah, if you've been in the art world for any amount of time, you know that that's uh, surprisingly extremely difficult to find. <laughs> Most art education is uh, people not trusting you and telling you what to do. And that's not really what it means to be an artist. It's certainly not what it means to be a designer, if that's what you're into. Mr. Lonely says, hey, it's me, Mr. Artist Research again. Well, hello, Mr. Lonely. Um, coming off of some sketches, all I got to say is thank you, man. Your work has allowed me to be more loose with my work. Most fun I've had in years. Mr. Lonely, I prostrate myself before you. It is an honor to have contributed to your art journey. What else could I want? What better thing could I offer in this crazy wide world than to make the creation of art a little easier for other human beings. You do me a great honor by allowing me into that most cosmic, personal, and transcendent aspect of your life, even if only for a tiny moment, right? There's so many other more mundane ways that we could have intersected, but instead we got to intersect in this extremely interesting, extremely psychedelic way, my preference. So thank you. Steven, do you have a schedule for these live sessions? Do you do them weekly and at what time? No, I don't really have a schedule. I do them when I can. I also bounce back and forth between my, um, my Patreon, Discord, and here on YouTube. I just try to keep it flexible. What keeps them coming is that they're flexible. It's really easy to burn out doing art though if i'm perfectly honest if i was like it's every thursday no matter what i'm the most gritty you know i'm so disciplined i show up here every time like art is just any other job like you just show up and you do the work it's not about motivation if i do that they're not going to get made but because i'm flexible i do them pretty often this way, I think.
Otis Finch says, thanks for the tip on the strength training anatomy book. It's helping a lot. Otis Finch, knock yourself out. Get into that strength training anatomy by Frederick Delavere, third edition. Soak it up, get that anatomy knowledge, drink it up with a straw. Get in there and know all the names, all the words sound pretentious at parties. Get that brachial radialis. Get that rectus abdominis. Get that rectus femoris, that infraspinatus, that teres major. They like them apples. Don't forget the Baximus Maximus, the biggest muscle of them all. Steven, what do you think represents a healer? Herbs, nature? Um, I think so. But there's all sorts of healers. Depends on the project. You could do a more clinical healer, you know, like a hard science kind of healer, Western medicine sort of thing. Very anti-nature. Do it more like surgical equipment graphic shapes and things like that. Surgical, surgical equipment is really iconic. You could probably make a really cool design out of that. But yeah, if you want the more natural thing, plants, herbs. Where's my, uh, what was that thing? I did a design a long time ago. Do, do, do. What was it? This one. I did this design a long time ago for a robot healer nurturer. Based it on succulents and like the little grids that they grow them on and things like that. She was part of a team. was a thousand years ago. What should I do if I feel overwhelmed by the amount of ways or methods there are to study drawing and painting, like the constructive approach and the observational approach? Should I grab both? That's what I did. 
just subsume it all. Take what works from one, abandon what doesn't work, combine it with what works from another. Just do that over and over and over again. That's what always worked for me. No method, no school, no way of thought on its own is the answer. They all need to be combined and they need to be made better through your lens, your opinions, your preferences, and your taste. Anything less than that will always fall short. And surely anyone who executes perfectly within the bounds of any particular art school is someone who executes perfectly within the bounds of tear-jerking boredom. And you don't want that, do you? I'm trying to think of different designs for the three biblical archangels, but it's hard to escape the common representations. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta get out. You gotta escape. You've gotta empty out, empty the cup. Put something new in there. Go, uh, go look at something you've never looked at before. Go take a trip to some unexpected place. Go get on someone's boat and have them take you wherever they want. And if they take you somewhere scary, don't defend yourself. Go with them. And if they open a scary door, don't defend yourself. Just go through the door. Only way to be a good artist. Get out there and get yourself in some serious trouble.
One day modern day James is telling us to go get punched and next Stephen is telling us to go with strangers and not resist. Real art education is quite wild it seems. Yeah, what'd you expect? Art's weird. Get on board, let's go. What else is up, people? Come on. Come on. What's wrong? Tired on a Monday night? It's 9 p.m. on a Monday night in my part of the world right now. Let me tell you, there's nothing I'd rather be doing on a Monday night than drawing some monsters. Steven looking great. Oh. Just some beasties. Just keeping up the beastie mileage. Streaming to get my endurance up for a workshop next month. Gotta have my stream endurance very much up for workshop. Long classes, college style, five hours long. how long classes are in my mentorship workshop because uh, that's how long my studios were teaching art in college taught five hour classes got used to it you know what I learned teaching five hour classes barely enough time to get it all out right about the edge of someone's fatigue level what people can put up with if they're paying attention the whole time and uh, still art is so big Barely enough time. Barely enough time to get it out. Those monsters got some class, you know. That's what we do around here. Did you ever do hard surface stuff? Yeah, plenty of times. I still do it on occasion. I never did it like super technical, like as, you know. I never did it as like hard surface for hard surface sake. Like, what's the most technical we can do? Like it was gonna become a ZBrush model or something like that. Never did that, but. You know, like, did you ever draw cars, draw spaceships, stuff like that? Yeah. fun to draw the stuff it's fun to draw the stuff i draw the stuff on monday night i draw the stuff all night i'd do it more if i could on second thought i think i will i'll draw the stuff i'll draw the stuff all night see i took my headphones off to give my ears a rest and right away my brain had to fill the the silence with my stupid voice 
couldn't resist. Hmm, I could do a moment. I wonder if I could do basically this moment that is on this form. It's like a bicep insertion over here. That would be nice because I love that particular form interaction. It looks like the flower is hugging itself. So let's see if I can recreate that a bit and add that to my mental form library. Kind of funny how automatic it was. Oh yeah, real funny. Real funny to just be driven by my circumstances subconsciously. Can you share the playlist, please? I don't know that I can. Can I? There it is. I think you should be able to listen to it there. I think, um... I'm pretty sure you can listen to all the music on Epidemic Sound even without an account or using it as a creator or anything like that. I think it should just let you listen to it. I've never tried it myself, so let me know if that's not the case. Yes, Magda, you would be right on most days that it is lo-fi girl. But this time I'm using epidemic sound. Most of the songs, if you just search the name on like Spotify or something, you'll find them on Spotify too. It's just that's where I'm playing them, so they're all collected there. I think I never asked you this before. Steven, color palette. I enjoy a lot your saturated green and purple palettes. Which colors would you say are your most appealing ones? Um, my, um, the colors that I like using are actually, uh, I like using them for non-colorist reasons, for non-co- or I guess maybe the least color-related reason. 
um, the colors that I default to, the cools, the blues, the greens, things like that, um, I use those because they are saturated throughout their value range, more so than something like a, like a red or a yellow. Uh, and I am a form-based artist. That's how I think of things and that's how I have my ideas. So value range is everything for someone who's form-based because the more values you have, the more form you can show, the more you can roll form and stuff like that. So that's why I use the colors that I use because they remain colorful when they're really light and when they're really dark. So I can just draw with them the way that I would in monochrome. Whereas doing that is very difficult with yellow, for example, because its chroma point is so high and it does not remain saturated throughout its value range. Yellow turns into mud or into green once it's like below a 30% gray. So uh, I have a lot of trouble using those colors and I generally avoid them. So that's really what gives me my, my particular color palette just keeps me drawing instead of uh, putting on sort of my painting hat. Dane Cozen says, you would love the challenge of slot machine art. Everything is super saturated, but you're still trying to get the form. <laughs> My gut says I would not love the challenge. <laughs> I don't know why I don't receive a notification when you go live. Anyone else having the same problem or is it a memories exclusive thing? Uh, I don't know. I think it might just be a general YouTube problem. I feel like that's a universal complaint on YouTube that notifications don't work the way they're supposed to.
after you do something when you're burnt out to escape that period, do whatever it takes. I'm getting out at any cost. I'll even go so far as to not draw and rest. That's right. That's the kind of insane freak that I am. When I'm really, really burnt out, I'm so out of my mind, I'm so crazy, I'm so out of control, that I'll actually take a day off. I'll like go read or like just sit and look at trees for a whole day or I'll like do something fun play a game I've never played before or like just do something weird I've never done before like pick up a weird hobby just for a day and then put it down after a day or like do some weird craft like making macaroni bracelets or something like that. Or I'll just veg, hardcore veg, for a whole day. Sometimes more than a day. You know what's great about sitting and doing absolutely nothing? for no reason, with no ulterior motive. So you get rested really quick, and then pretty soon you're like, eh, I guess I feel like doing something. I'm crazy, I know I'm crazy. Yeah, it's, if I'm just tired, yeah, I just take time off. Like, that's not a big deal. My body will thank me. I've been drawing so long and just made so much art that it's like, what could it matter? You know, just a day or two here or there really doesn't add up to anything in the long run compared to the crazy amount of drawing that I have done. Um, but that's just being tired. I think true burnout, where it's like, it's more than that, you know? You rest your body, you rest your mind, and you still uh, are experiencing resistance. That's not, that's like an emotional thing. There's like some sort of, there's a blockage, you know? You're thinking too much about your mom or something like that. And those things need to be addressed um, if you really want to get to the core of that, of deeper, deeper burnout. like. Burnout is more often caused by doing work you hate uh, for one reason or the other, either because you feel like that's what you have to be doing or you're forced to by work or um, being straddled with the expectations of others or yeah, it's usually some sort of cognitive dissonance, just pushing yourself to do something that you actually don't like. Um, to impress either yourself or others and um, that causes a deeper more existential burnout that is a different thing to get out from under Are you attempting to... Wait, hold on a second. You're crazy, yes. Logan says, Love to see the streams again, Steven. Glad you've come out of the work hole to, great, to greet us with such great weird content. Well, you know, 
love to keep it weird, love to draw some monsters. Raina says, are you attempting to suggest that taking a break actually leads to more productivity? Yes, but also I have to say, I think it's a bad idea to rest with an ulterior motive. I don't think that's good either. I think that that's just um, our cultural programming sneaking in through the back door. I think that as an artist, when you rest, you should really rest. Don't do it for any reason. Don't do it for what it's going to benefit you later. Don't do it so that the work is better later. Don't do it so that you're working hard, playing hard. Turn all of that crap off and rest for no reason. Rest. Rest the way you would rest even if you knew the rest would make the work worse. Do it for that. Rest for its own sake. Rest because you don't need to just explode outward all the time trying to reach other people's expectations your own unvetted expectations just the weird impulsive little goals and standards that society has given to you rest because uh, you don't really need to do anything else right like rest because you're secure enough in yourself and generous enough with yourself that you do not need to constantly be outputting in order to prove that you're living your life right either to yourself or to your family or to your friends or your partner whoever right all of that stuff if not kept in balance becomes a rot a growing, tangled, lichenous growth on the art practice that slowly strangles it and becomes, extre becomes extremely difficult to extricate yourself from. I would avoid that at all costs. Practice letting yourself rest for absolutely no reason as often as you can. Just go all the way back to center. Go back to what you are way down, deep, deep down at your core. And what you are at your core is, um, it's already achieved. It's already given. You're good. You know, you're nothing but the ontological nature of the universe, right? Whatever the end of philosophy is, whatever the end of science is, whatever the ultimate answer to the ultimate question is, you're already living it, baby. So give yourself a second to just sit in it because uh, you already achieved the miracle. Everything else is just icing on top. Yep, just the usual. Hi, everything, brothers.
Do you often photo bash? Not these days. I used to for work all the time. There's plenty of photo bashing in my day. But, um, yeah, I, I rarely do it now. My, um, the work that I do for clients, um, slowly transformed. People hire me more for design sketching now. Um, and in the field that I operate in, I don't really need to do that with photos, which is great because I find photo bashing horribly boring. So my client work has moved away from doing much photo bashing at all. And um, yeah, when I, when I draw on stream and stuff like that, when I draw my own stuff, I just don't use it. It's just never been my, my interest. And um, I'm not trying to live up to like any um, arbitrary industry standard, you know? I'm, it's not like I'm trying to make a, um, like a concept artist portfolio to get into a studio or anything like that. So I don't need to worry about the speed benefits of photo bashing or anything like that. So yeah, I just don't do it. And I just have fun making shapes by hand and things like that. And it's nice to get the nature of the shapes into my muscle memory and to engage with the shapes directly. But um, if I'm perfectly honest, it probably holds back the final result for design stuff. It's just not fun. I just don't have fun doing it, so I don't do it. And the, if I was doing it, I'd really only be doing it for, like I said, it'd be so arbitrary to start doing it because um, I'm not doing this for a book or for a job or anything like that. But all that said, yes, I have done much of it over the years. I'm okay at it. You know, I'm good enough at it to use it at work and to do it professionally, but I'm not as good at it as uh, people who actually have fun photo bashing. Which makes sense. Because while I'm doing it, I'm just thinking about how long until I get to stop. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I like spending a long time on pictures. You do art full time, you betcha. Lucky me. I gotta tell you, I do, um. Man. Life is good. What's up, y'all? Says, are you left-handed? I am not. I am right-handed. It 
took your advice and have been working on a project for a few weeks now, but it feels like it's stagnated. I'm a lot more focused on this on this than other long-term projects I've attempted, but I'm kind of lost on how to put ideas together. Um, show it to friends. That's usually a good idea when you feel like it's stagnated. Show it to some of your art friends or any art teachers that you may have. Have them beat it up for you. Have a good conversation with them. If the putting the ideas together part is really the problem, then that's usually what helps with that. The best thing I can recommend about that is um, like present it to them, like do a little, like explain it to them as clearly as you can. Don't BS it, like write something and tell it to your friend or partner or whoever you're showing it to. Um, try to put into words as seriously as you can what you think is going on here. Do not just sit with them and go, um, yeah, so I think it's made like, uh, you know, I thought kind of, mm, yeah, mm, uh, you know, like don't do that for a half hour. The more useful thing is write down for yourself what you think the project actually is in the writing, you're going to realize that you hadn't thought through anything. You were just dealing with abstract concepts. And as soon as you try to put them into words, you'll realize that all of that is less than dust. Those are just mind clouds and uh, you have so much left to think through. Um, and writing it out will help you do that. And then having to speak it to a person with precision instead of just BSing it will reveal to you in a way that you really do not understand right now will reveal to you what you actually think the project is. When I teach these project-based classes, uh, when I have in the past, I have these students present the project uh, every week, right? You know, if I'm teaching like a 14-week class, I have them present it 14 times. And um, there's just no getting around it. Having to say it earnestly over and over again every time transforms it. You know, your, your abstract thoughts, the weird, muddy images that you work with when you're just working on your own, there's so little there. There's really so little there. You need to say it. You need to present it. You need to explain it to someone else.
Not to repeat my question, but how should one limit their influences on art? I mean... You shouldn't really limit them unless you're going through a difficult period where your influences are helping you, right? Artists tend to be either in a positive period with influences where you're not really comparing yourself to them, you're just learning from them and things like that. That's good. In that situation, don't, don't limit anything. Just let yourself naturally enjoy what you naturally enjoy. Um, if, however, you're in a dark period where um, basically every time you see a picture, the first thing that you do is you assess it in relationship to yourself, right? You're like, I could do better than that. I can't do as good as that. That person's a better artist than me. That person makes more art than me. Well, how am I ever going to get there? If that, if it just starts that recursive process, just stop looking at everything. Look at other kinds of art, stuff that you don't compare yourself to. Like, there's plenty of great influence in, uh, in music. If you're a visual artist, there's plenty, plenty of great influence in botany, in aerospace engineering. Like you don't need to look at other people's art. My problem is that I try to add all these cool things I see to my art, but they don't mix well. Well, that might be a different problem. That might be a, um, a lack of design knowledge and taste and experience. Um, if that's really the problem, like blending parts of one influence into another, that you'll just get better with at with time understand that something on that level something with that kind of scope you are actually you're touching upon something there where it's like if you could blend that well and if you could have the good taste for when to pull back and when to add it you're kind of ready for a career like that's a career defining skill set so it is hard and there's no need to like rush or like think that you need to be good at it right now. The ability to blend influence as well. Yeah, if you're really nailing it, it's like you're just ready to be a designer, a professional designer. So it's tough stuff, tough skills. Um, it's not easy. It's really not easy. Um, I'd say the beginning of that road is understanding what the constituent parts are. Start there. I would say. So break things down into the elements of design, the elements of art. So line, value, shape, texture, form, space, negative space. If you've never heard those words, go look them up, start doing some basic research, and then add on top of that the principles of design. So contrast, rhythm, emphasis, hierarchy, variety, economy, repetition, movement, continuity, unity. And again, if you haven't heard a lot of those words, go look up the principles of design and start doing some basic research. Um, there's no solid answers there. There's no like one go-to answer on any of those things. Any one of those things is a very deep realm in and of itself, but those are the foundations. And for my money, if you can sort of wrap your head around that stuff, they are what will allow you to duck, weave, dance, pivot, change, and uh, be unstoppable when it comes to making tasteful designs. But I don't want to lie to you. What you described 
it is that at its core. It's being a tasteful designer. And like I said, that is career and often life defining. So it's not like um it's not like a step or like a little thing. It's kind of like an overall goal, you know? Often do you use reference? All the time. But I also paint out of my head all the time. If you, uh, if you watch these streams enough, you'll see that I'm... I'm not kidding when I say it's all the time to both, right? I'm always making stuff up and I'm always uh, benchmarking off of reality and trying to get some of the weirdness of reality um, into my designs. So yeah, it's both. I make stuff up completely all the time, and I draw from reference all the time, and their conversation basically amounts to my art. It's pretty sick, man. I just let them handle each other. Like, um, I don't feel enslaved to any of the stuff that I find boring about reference. And I also don't feel enslaved to drawing in a boring way just because I'm drawing from reference, right? I don't measure, I don't do guides and stuff like that when I draw from reference. I just freehand it um, and I draw it kind of as if I was drawing it from my head. I use the way I draw from my head as a emotional and mechanical reference point for how I draw from reference. So. I use the imagination drawing to balance out and keep me from getting bored doing reference drawing. And um, same thing for the imaginative side. I just use reference as soon as anything starts breaking my head or feeling like it's becoming boring because I'm repeating shapes. Or especially um, when you draw from imagination a lot, you keep encountering over and over again that you're your brain regurgitates things that lack insight. So instead of slamming my head against that over and over again to no avail, I just go look at a photograph of reality, which is full of nothing but psychedelic acid trips uh, and the most interesting things that are out there in the world, and I just steal them outright. Sometimes I don't look at the references while I work. I, um, I'll look at them on a lunch break or just as its own activity while sitting around. Um, it's like I'm not drawing and looking at reference. I'm like just looking at reference for half an hour or something like that. But when I'm looking, I'm looking at it. Like um, I bet you've never looked at anything as intensely as I'm looking at it when I do that. And I'm doing it for like a half hour. So I remember it. And then I don't need to look at it when I go draw. I can remember what I learned. The eurekas that I had just from looking. I can remember it from my head. And then I just add that insight to my, imagine, my imagination drawing. But I have no qualms. I have no barriers. I have no shackles. I have no random assumptions. I have no annoying prejudices. I just do whatever I want whenever I want. And I always feel free to change. And I reserve the right to contradict myself. Because I am the universe, I contain the
Studies have been following me for a while. I love your point of view. Thank you. Should I study from real pictures or paintings done by other artists? Um, both, if you have the time. You know, that's what always did it for me. Both. It, um, if you had to pick one, if you had to pick one, it'll feel worse as you do it you know you'll go through you'll go through very difficult times if you pick this one but i think in the long run uh real pictures are better than paintings by other artists if you had to pick one but um just do both both is the way to go if you only copied other artists that would feel better while you do it because other artists are sort of giving you the answer but the more robust education comes from reality and don't forget to like see real stuff, go places and things like that. Um, photos are good. And it's not like I'm saying like you see better in reality or something like that. Like photos stay still and they're often much crisper than our eyes. But um, you don't have a personal connection to what's in the photography most of the time. Um, and you're either going to believe me or not, but I really can't overstate the importance of that personal connection. Like, you will just be more willing to put effort and care and love into a depiction of something that you are intimately familiar with, something that you know and love or have been to and experienced yourself. You'll be much more willing to put the necessary time and suffering into that than, um, just some random photo from Pinterest. Like the real trick is trying to find out what makes you utterly fascinated, you know? That seems to be the bigger problem most of the time. It's much more likely that you will be utterly fascinated by something you had a personal experience with than uh, some random thing that you found online.
you done with what you're doing? Oh yeah, that's your book. David Pham says, Stephen, I miss your pencil drawing. It's coming. It always comes back. That's something that, uh, that's something that never goes away for long. That urge recurs over and over and over again. Urge to do stuff like this, this will suddenly turn off for like years, <laughs> years at a time. I won't want to do any straight up design work for years at a clip. Don't you worry about the pencils, they'll always be around. And then when that urge comes around and all I've done is pencils for months and months and I stream digital, half the chat will be like, well, you do digital too? And the universe contains it. make so much art man it's like I'm running like six different art practices Dane says, not sure if this might be an interesting question for you. What do you think are some of the common problems for artists once they've been in the industry for a few years? Uh, oof. I mean, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. Um, I would say the most common one is um, thinking that the job or the validation that you're a professional artist now would like be robust that that would satisfy you or that it would somehow change things um that's the most common one um that can either start immediately as soon as you've hit that goal or it can be like you said uh a few years into the industry but that one i don't know that one gets people gets people really easily Basically, you you bend all of your creativity and all of your decision making towards fitting someone else's mold, uh, just so that you can get the job and have the insane, rare experience of oh my god, I'm a professional artist now, and then <laughs> you do that for a minute and you're like oh no, that doesn't that doesn't change anything about the moment to moment spent drawing and uh, I need to really love what I'm drawing or be enjoying how I'm doing it or else, um, guess what? Nobody cares that you're a professional artist and uh, it's not going to help you sleep at night. So um, yeah, that one unhorses people very readily. Start, su start sustainable. That's what I would say to that. Do whatever you can. You know, if you need money, it's different and you feel like art is the only way you can get money, you know, it's like your only skill set and stuff like that. 
that's, you know, do whatever you need to do. Do absolutely whatever you need to do. I'm not telling you not to do anything, but um, if you have room to rest, to move, to pivot, to uh, be as thoughtful about things as possible, start sustainable if you can. Um, a lot of people think if they get one kind of art job that maybe like isn't really quite what they want to be doing, um, oh, well, you know, at least I'll be making money and I'll do the other kind of art I like to do at night. It's like, freaks can do that, but we're not all freaks. We're not all blessed with that. Most people, you, um, you shackle your creativity to someone else's prompts and what they need out of you for nine hours a day. And the last thing you're going to have energy to do when you get home is make more art. So, yeah, I just know tons of artists who butted up against that and it causes a lot of existential dread because instead of treating yourself like a human being and being very compassionate for the situation that you found yourself in most artists just do what they do best which is beat up on themselves so they're like i'm a loser i'm a failure i'm unmotivated and bad because i don't have the energy to do my own art at night after being professionally creative for eight hours a day uh for money um it causes existential dread it causes the desire to lift themselves by their own bootstraps, which is impossible, and um, they burn out. And then uh, a lot of them just, uh, they think that that situation describes the whole art situation, so they quit. They're like, oh my god, art's not worth it, I don't want to do this anymore. And then uh, if they have some other fallback skill, they'll go do that instead. Um, you know, hopefully some other high paying thing, because uh, art is just way too stressful and unsustainable. Or, um, or if they have no fallback, then they're living the real nightmare. Then they're stuck making art for a job every day and they hate it now. They hate art. It killed their art spirit. It murdered the demon. And um, well, that's uh, just about one of the greatest tragedies in the world as far as I'm concerned. And uh, on this little YouTube channel, I'm trying to fight a war against that tragedy to prevent that one person one little bit of insight at a time it does happen you want to know what's the real trip it's happening to some of your favorite artists that's a bummer that's awesome <laughs> so avoid it at all costs if you can it's not an easy road but very little about art is easy. Doing it is easy. Everything else is not. None of the trappings are easy. Oh, thank you, anything goes. That's kind. You're all very sweet. You're all very, very sweet. I feel very lucky to have such a sweet community. I'll tell you that. Does switching the medium help you enjoy creating? Yeah. I'm a very mercurial fellow. I love changing. And uh, my mind and my art practice offer me, yeah, just, they're not consistent. They just offer me all sorts of different things that I want to do. And um, yeah, I'm just lucky enough that uh, I'm in a situation now where I just get to do that. You know, <laughs> I just get to um, 
basically follow those whims and uh, I've got a life that supports that now. Um, whereas in the beginning, when you're trying to get your art practice together and make it sustainable and God help you if you want to turn it into a job like I did for many years, um, it, um, it really fights against being mer mercurial. It really wants you to be one thing over and over and over again so that people understand you in an instant and so that jobs find it easier to swallow hiring you. Um, that's definitely more uh, more incentivized in those environments. But um, yeah, this this life is much more fun for me, much more fun. For my second question, can anyone condition themselves to become a freak? Not will everyone have the drive, willpower, however, just wondering if the potential is there. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. I think that's a super complex question. And I think it it's probably a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like let's say that you would eventually become a freak um if you started with a question like can anyone condition themselves to become a freak like that sounds like a question a freak would ask right like that doesn't sound like a steady down-to-earth question that a normal person would ask so it's like it's almost a self-selecting set like if you're thinking about those things and like how to optimize and stuff like that you're probably already a freak. You're just like in your gestation period or something like that. Um, yeah, I think it's super, super nuanced and difficult. Um, my, I think people's potential is pretty vast, but um, I think for most people, yeah. Being a freak in this sense is like a very specific thing and um what i'm trying to say is that it's not it's not actually desirable a lot of the time like i don't think you want to be a freak for the most part freaks have very hard lives <laughs> um and to be one you would probably be giving up a bunch of stuff that you really love like leisure time time with your family time with people that you care about um relationships where you can be like easy going in them instead of constantly setting boundaries and being like no i won't do that or go do this thing with you because i have this freaky lifestyle that i need to maintain and stuff like that like you probably don't want to be a freak you know there's a little part of you that like here's the word freak and here's me saying it and it's like yes 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 i must be a freak i want to be a freak yes i want to be really freaky in this way no you don't no you don't you don't actually want that. If you actually saw what it means to live that way and the weird sacrifices that you'd have to make and the strange way you'd have to come off at parties, you probably don't want it. You probably don't want it. And you can have a you can have an art practice and uh and a job and a, and an art career and stuff like that without being a freak. You just need to sort of realize what you need to do to get around having um need to have more realistic expectations you know and uh and be cunning about that and get savvy with business stuff to compensate for that um yeah i don't think most people want the um the freakish lifestyle It's not healthy for the most part. The people who are sustainably freaks, I think very few of them condition themselves for it. Maybe you can condition yourself for it, but I don't know how you keep it sustainable while sort of manifesting it willfully in that way.
running a little behind here. Samurai Reflection says, Steven, you're definitely one of the best artists around. I hope everybody finds this channel that's interested in art. Thank you, Samurai Reflection. You're beautiful. You're a wonderful thing. You're a goose being effortlessly reflected in a pond as it flies over. Is video choppy on anyone else's end? Uh, I saw some orange pings back there earlier, but it's looking green on my end now. Hopefully it should be ironed out. Should be all right. Kind Dude says, Hey Steven, any advice on how to get out of the fear of making bad drawings, even though I know I'm going to make a bad drawing? Yeah, it's just, um, it's sort of a self-contradictory thing, um, being afraid of be making bad drawings. Um, I don't know, I think everyone needs to hear something different to make it land or something like that. Um, let me tell you this, something that I really, really believe. Um, making good art with no other context. Just making random good drawings is not the realm of the beginner. It's the realm of the master. Because if you have no product that you're trying to make, no project that you're trying to achieve, no goal that you're trying to hit, then the only criteria that you have is that it looks great, right? And who are the only people who can make pictures look great? It's masters, right? Hate to say it, but most pictures are mediocre, right? They don't look great. And your taste, unfortunately, is made up of art that looks great, not art that looks mediocre. So that's for masters to do. The better thing to do, and what is the actual realm of the beginner, which is a little counterintuitive, is um, beginners should do project-based work. You need to add more criteria, more goals, more context to the stuff that you're doing so that you're not getting caught up on this weird, um, this weird amorphous thing that is making a good drawing, right? It's like, if you mean a good drawing and that it looks like a Sargent drawing or a, a Karl Kapinski drawing or an Elisa drawing or a Claire Wendling drawing, yeah, just like anybody else, I can guarantee you, no, you're not gonna pull it off. It's not gonna look like that for like, give or take another 10 years or something like that. So uh, is that really a good place to be? That sounds like a recipe for burnout for me. Add other criteria do a project, illustrate a book, try to make a product that you're gonna ship. That way, no, it's not gonna look like Karl Kapinski drew it, but it can be delivered on time, it can communicate the message, the characters can be clear, and it can tell a story. All of these other super valuable things about drawings and art can be achieved, and then you can leave one check box that will be unchecked for a very long time, which is that I think it looks sick, right? It's gonna take a while. It's gonna take a long time before you can check that box. That's just the nature of your taste um, outweighing your abilities. I think if you do that, that's a very good step towards getting over the fear of making a bad drawing. It's acceptance, and then there's other things to be done with art while we get to the good drawings. I think that that helps a lot of people. Alex Honeycutt says, I think becoming a freak is something you sort of stumble upon, feeling a spark to pursue kind of comes out of nowhere. It happened to me. It didn't really just happen. Yeah, generally agree, I think. I think that this is one of the most like weird philosophical discussions that you can have in regards to the art practice. Like what is talent? What's your potential? What's really available for people? Um, I think that beginners, intermediates and advanced practitioners all seem to have different general opinions. Um, and yeah, it gets really horribly tied up with, um, it gets really horribly tied up with people's thoughts on things like free will and just disposition and temperament and stuff like that. Like, um, I don't know, you know, it, I, I don't have an answer for how much can people change or something like that, right? Like I just, you know, if, if, um, if I had an answer to that, I'd probably be getting interviewed on the news, not uh, doing an, an, an art YouTube, you know, like that's such a huge psychological question that no one has a solid answer for. Um, it's really big. It's really big. 
I do think on this regard, if if we if we if we pare this whole discussion down to um, if we put it under the umbrella of talent and its constituent existential crises, um, I think Richard Schmidt had it right about talent, which he said in so many words, uh, just assume you have it and move on. E everything else beyond that is probably only going to hurt you, you know? Bye, Reyna. Anything Goes says, I'm always thinking about how to optimize, but I'm also completely incapable of focusing for longer than an hour or two or most. I think that may be an ADHD thing or something. It might be. Actually, to me, an hour or two sounds like good. That sounds like a lot. Um, I think doing two hours of work as an artist is super healthy. And then, you know, if you could do another two, after a long break, you could do another two hours. That's four hours. That's huge, right? If it's real work, if it's deep work, four hours is, I don't really think you need much more than that. You know, I used to get caught up on numbers and dump, you know, I was obsessed with putting eight hours on the clock or more uh, every day. But uh, I left that behind. These days I don't, I try to cut myself off at four-ish on most days, you know, especially if I'm only doing one thing, try not to do that for more than four hours. Today's in a, you know, I'm at seven hours on one thing today, but um, I try not to do that a lot. I, I, experience has taught me that that's a recipe for burnout. So I actually don't think an hour or two is really bad, you know? It's like, it's more about quality, quality over quantity. Have you ever had to deal with bad back pains before? I have not. Thank God. Not yet. Feel very lucky about that. My, um, I'm pretty hard on my body these days. You know, I'm rude to it, but it's treated me very well. Any advice for someone struggling with the rendering phase? I find that I don't know what to do because I get apathetic after the initial design and draw phase, which I enjoy way more. First, do you need to render? Do you actually want to render? This is, this is the most important question about this. Do you like rendering? If you don't like it, you don't actually need to do it, right? <laughs> I, I, I want to be very clear about that. Um, oh, God. Sorry, one second. I got distracted because uh, my uh, stream health is deteriorating rapidly. I don't know, we'll see about that. Um, like I was saying, first things first, you don't necessarily need to do it, all right? All of this stuff about like, oh, you need to be able to render well, you need to have these kinds of chops, you need to be able to make it look real. I can almost promise you that everyone who's saying that to you has no idea what they're talking about. Or you're assuming that from bits and pieces here and there, and that's not actually the case. Um, I'm, this is sort of like, Weird, this is some cognitive dissonance that's going on here and that a lot of artists have, right? You just said it to me. I don't know what to do because I get apathetic, so you don't care, after the initial design and draw phase, which I enjoy way more. So let me ask you again, why are you rendering? Maybe you should just be a designer. Just focus on great lines, great designs, great flat shapes. That's a career. You don't need to render well. And, do, and something about like, oh, well, I want to be a commercial illustrator or, or, a, or a concept artist or something like that. It's like everyone photo bashes. Just try photo bashing. If you hate rendering, just try photo bashing. If the only reason that you are photo bashing, uh, or if the only reason that you are trying to get good at rendering is because you think you need to be able to do it to consider yourself a good artist, I can confidently tell you to quit today. Stop thinking about rendering. Don't do it. I render because it's fun. That's the only reason that I, I can render well. I don't, it, it, that's it, full stop, right? I, um, I could not have gained the rendering ability that I have if I did not find it enjoyable. I like turning form and I like adding subforms to forms and I like managing 
a, a hierarchy of curvatures on subtle primary forms. That's it, you know? I didn't do it for anybody else. I didn't do it for the industry. The industry never wants me to do it. it takes too long. It was like, just give us a sketch. Yeah, yeah, we'll pay you full boat, whatever. It's like, <laughs> no, but nobody wants to wait that long for that stuff, you know? They catch you rendering. They're like, can you please just do it with a photo? Because we don't have time for this. You know, that's how most industries work. I've been drawing stuff that is not my taste for three years just to get a job in the industry. This year I'm going to quit it to focus on practicing my own art. Could you give me some advice? It's going to be hard. There's going to be a lot of challenges, but do not give up. Do not, don't give up on it. Keep going. Um, if you are the kind of person who has found themselves at this juncture at all, no matter what happens, no matter if you have to go to, back to the old stuff, if you have to go get a different kind of job, if you have to go do anything else that you might feel is a step backwards, it doesn't matter because you will always come back to this. So if you need to do those things, fine, but don't let it spiral out into like, all right, I didn't do it, I have to quit forever now because I can't do it the way that I want to do it. It's like you're always going to come back to it. You're never going to be able to give up on this. You're an artist, artist, artist with a capital A. Like you're only that kind of person makes this kind of decision and goes into that. So when you're really down and out, when it's hurting, when it's super hard, when you feel like quitting, remember, you're not really going to quit. So maybe don't even play with it. Just keep, stay the course, just hold on. And another thing to remember, and this has been very true for me, is that the moments that feel the worst, where it really feels like this is unbearable, why would anybody else be an artist? Why would anybody be an artist? Those moments are not special to you. Everybody who goes down the art path encounters those same moments at those same junctures. The trick is, because it feels so horrible, most people quit. So. If in that moment, if everything in your life is saying quit, you just remember that and then say, it's a good business move to not quit. If you stay the course there, the field will be thinned by half when you get to the other side of that decision. You do that over and over again, cut it in half, cut it in half, cut it in half, cut it in half. Pretty soon you're in very rarefied territory. So there's, a, there's great benefit to not quitting. Trust me when I say that. I've been studying fundamentals for a while, for a while now, but every time I want to design something, I feel that they look really generic most of the time. Any tips to avoid that? Um, again, this is one of those things where, uh, sort of like another question that someone asked before, you're asking me to give you a tip on a thing that, if you could do it well, that's a whole job, right? Like most designs will always look generic because designing unique things is very hard. It's professional level stuff. So um, you're asking me to give you a tip that, yeah, if you could design stuff that didn't look generic, it's like you're ready to work, right? That to make, in the ultimate sense, unique designs that aren't generic is just, that's industry ready, right? People are gonna pay for that. So uh, it's a tough thing to give single tips for. Um, the what I usually advise people to do is to be 
Be influenced and be influenced well. Get judicious about what you think is good and what is bad. Be super opinionated. Be able to write down your opinion. Be, be able to put it into words. Make it so that you could say to someone what your opinion is about what is better shapes, what is better lines, what is better values, what is better colors. You pile enough of those up on top of each other and you collect great influences that you are super judicious about, right? It, it doesn't matter. It's like, all right, it has a lot of likes, but I think it's crap, so screw it. No, this is what's really good. Other people don't understand. Like, be a prick about it. You know, be super pretentious about it. Be like, have a super high bar. Just say, I like nothing right and adopt a dark cynicism about anything that's likable and then hold on to the things that break through that cynicism and make you go whoa now that's good collect those and that that's the beginning of being able to make unique designs uh as far as i can tell um it's a hard road to hoe you know most people will go their whole careers making generic things because um unique is tough unique is tough Yeah, I drew a lot today, just sort of spontaneously. I guess that's just because um, I guess that's just because I was on vacation, I'm well rested, and I was hungry to draw by the end of vacation. I mean, I was having fun, but um, I really just like creating. <laughs> it's fun, so I was hankering. The time I was near the end of the trip, I guess that just sort of exploded into me, it exploded out of me. But um, people who've heard my advice long enough probably know that I'm a little worried about that. It's like, probably I'm in danger of having drained the tank and I'm going to wake up tomorrow like, eh, I kind of got it out of my system. That's why I say to people, like, lower the numbers a bit. Do the most that you can do and then reel it back slightly. Find what your limit is and then try not to hit that absolute limit day to day. Just pull back a little bit. That way you always leave a little bit for the next day. You wake up excited. You know what you want to do to your pictures when you sit down to them the next day instead of encountering them as like, oh God, what happens now, you know? Whenever you consider quitting, maybe just consider not quitting. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Bosa says, God, I wish I found this kind of advice and resources back when I quit art as a kid because I only felt hatred towards my drawings. I also wish you had found this advice. That's why I made the channel. Straight up. I've heard your story many times and seen artists go through it many times. So That's why I'm out here. That's why the channel's here literally to fight that that's why i started it that's why uh 
That's why if you go all the way back in the channel, there's no tutorials, right? There's no, <laughs> here's how to draw this or here's how to draw that. And uh, truly, there's very, very little of that on the channel. If you go back to the start of the channel, it's all um, how to avoid this insidious mental crap that accrues on artists, that grows on them like barnacles. Is a lot of your skill intuitive or very structured logical decisions? I know a lot of traditional artists like Kroko have a very simple thought process versus a more creative, unique approach. Um, well, I don't know if any advanced art practice has any simple decision making, but yeah, it's more intuitive. There's no, um, it'd be very difficult to put it into words in granular detail. I started much more logical uh, in a lot of the educational portion of my journey, but um, after a while I realized that that was insufficient. I was falling behind doing that instead of letting go, and I was experiencing great improvement and advancement, including in my technical skill, by um, abandoning the strict logical decision making. So I've been on both sides of the coin, I feel like. And who knows, maybe someday I'll go back to the logical structured thing, but for now that seems crazy. It's like art needs to feel fun while you do it. Bless you.
Well, it's like Steven is in the zone. Oh, he's in the zone. And hello, one. Would you say that intuition comes naturally after repetition and understanding of studies? Um, yeah, if you seek it. Not always. I know plenty of artists who have spent years and years studying, and then the first time someone asks them to be creative in 10 years, they're like, Be what now? Do what? You want me to be creative? You want, you want me to re relax? Huh, I, uh... I guess I forgot how to do that. That happens to tons of artists. Because the problem is that if you are rehearsing, it comes down to how you practice, right? So if you're doing repetition and understanding of studies while feeling depressed, anxious, like you're never going to get there, wound up, uh, tight as a ball of centipedes, yeah, like that's what you're rehearsing right if you're never rehearsing being relaxed you're never practicing it you're not creating the mental groove for sitting being happy making a picture for five hours that's actually something you need to practice that's a skill on its own so if you're doing that if you're practicing being happy and being relaxed while you're doing your repetition understanding of studies, then yeah, yeah, intuition will come naturally at some point. But if, you're, if your practice is subtly a practice of pain and suffering, doesn't matter how good you get. Every time you sit down at the paper, you will manifest pain and suffering. And there's very little that can happen on the page that will change that if you're doing it thoughtlessly. Have you ever tried clay or wood carving before? Yeah, I've sculpted in clay before. Not much, but a good bit. I had to deliver a few pretty big assignments back in school in clay. I have to say I prefer, I prefer making the illusion of form rather than making real form. intuition i mean for example you study the structure of a body you can eventually draw a body without the guidelines and such maybe intuition is the wrong word yeah like jose said maybe that's more memory than intuition that's one of the difficult things about art uh even amongst artists we really can't agree on our terms most conversations between artists should start like a like a philosophy debate with a definition of terms in order to make sure everybody's on the same page or else you can just be talking at cross purposes for hours
I just remembered that I have to walk the dog or bed. And it's like so cold outside in New York today. It's gonna be all right. It's gonna be good. Got a three-year cold snap barreling down on us in New York. Gets pretty dang cold around here. I'm not used to looking up references, like I just want to make up the drawing as I go by recalling things from memory, but I'm trying to break the laziness of looking things up. Yeah, I know where you're coming from. I mean, memory drawing, imaginative drawing was always my emphasis in my art practice, so I know that feeling of really wanting to do it above all else, but um, there's really no getting around it. It's like, you're just not as creative as nature. You know, like nature has, nature made you. So you're not going to be able to catch up. Um, you got to you gotta let it teach you. You know, you have to humble yourself before nature. Um, but yeah, I was very, I was very focused on um, probably at the far end of the spectrum, probably more focused on working from imagination and memory than, um, than the vast majority of artists. And um, yeah, the abilities that I have the abilities that I uh, have in it now um, are hugely dependent on what I've learned from drawing from reference and stuff like that. I did, yeah, I did, for most of my drawing time, um, yeah, I'm just trying to think it through. Yeah, for most of my drawing improvement time, um, I was drawing from reference, you know, I realized really quick I needed to do it to get better at drawing from imagination. So I always, I very early on like put them in relationship with each other, but um, imagination was always my goal, was my focus. And I always sort of, I always prioritized it like. I, I practiced in ways when doing my reference drawings that um, made my reference drawings come out worse, but at least they, um, it made it so that I knew they would translate directly to, I knew that they would translate directly to what was going on in my imaginative work. Which I think is important.
bit of a weird question, but is there anything that you've personally found that might hamper your creative process? Have you found any contingencies and navigate them? I've I've done nothing but find things that will hamper my creativity. My um, I have a very neurotic classic artist brain, so um, my mind is more prone to offer reasons for why I should not be creative than to offer reasons to be creative. So yeah, I, unfortunately, I've got nothing but what you said. And um, essentially my whole art practice is nothing but tailor-made little contingencies to get me around those things. So bit of a big question to answer. Yeah, I've been... Um, I have gone through every kind of hampering over the years, I would say. Love the content and stream. Can't wait to join the next one. Can't wait to do the next one. Tell you what. Your reference use is so next level. I got to learn that. Does having them be vague help make your mind be creative? Maybe the trick is to not have two specific refs. I like doing that. Yeah, I like to... Um, I like to use reference. I do use it directly, but more often I'll put up boards that sort of just remind me of how interesting interesting actually is, you know? A lot of photos of weird stuff from nature just to remind me that I'm doing the same old dumb boring thing over and over and over again and that I need to reach a little bit to get to the weird stuff to get to the stuff that nature opens up and get some of that in there so a lot of the times my references are not one-to-one -one. they're just to inspire me to push to go there and do that weird stuff did reading berserk help you with pushing through some of the suffering of learning art no I, I read berserk like uh, I I didn't read all of it and I just I started reading it like four months ago a few months it, last year so no it, it's had very little um, impact on my learning of art it's sort of already formed in many ways <laughs> before before engaging it do you have any favorite anime drawing artists no since I've only really read Berserk uh, It'd be weird to say that Miura is a favorite because I really haven't compared. But yeah, I'm going to say no. I mean, Miura is great, right? But I don't think of him as a favorite anime or manga drawing artist. Just an artist. Right? I'm not comparing him to the rest of that genre or something like that. Hey Steven, how do you get your skin so glowing and smooth? Blast it with lights. <laughs> a lot of light on it. Just point a very bright light directly at your face. I love drawing and I've done nothing but draw for months now, but I don't really consume much art and I'm generally not too attracted to most mainstream art. Does this affect me in the long run? Only financially probably affect your art positively yeah it's probably a good thing don't ever change as someone who doesn't do mainstream art um, I have to admit it you know you do take a hit right but the um, the benefits of doing what you really want are um, they're their own reward you know and the satisfaction of building a platform or an audience or just a life off of 
not making any concessions off of just doing exactly what you want to do moment to moment with um yeah without feeling like it needs to be relevant or needs to like be fan art or something like that it's like like i said its own reward if you care about that kind of thing obviously if you like doing fan art and do it. I just don't. So it was always um it was always a serious uh serious consideration for me like hmm how am I going to get my art out there in the world and uh get it getting any traction if um I don't really draw anything people like. <laughs> I draw really scary, unappealing things that no one has ever seen before, so they don't have a personal connection with it. Started with a handicap, that's for sure. Playing on hard mode here. Steven, I follow both of your Instagram accounts. <gasps> Do you stay conscious of storytelling when working on your pieces? If it's a storytelling focused piece, yeah, for sure. But um, I do lots of art that is really not so much about story. It's just about can I surprise you with some interesting shapes that you've never seen before? That's plenty of my art. That's less about story. That's maybe the story of form, but it's not narrative. have been live for three and a half hours and it's coming up on 11 p.m in new york and i've been drawing for seven and a half hours today so i'm gonna call it just a couple bold lines here to wrap up this design for this last creature on this page which i have now made the statement for i just like i said i looked at the design from top to bottom you know, it's problems, the things that I would change, they can all be addressed if I come back to it in a day or two and I'm like, you know what, let's make it better. Um, I get to look at the whole thing instead of having a problem to solve before I can make the assessment. I've seen the feet, I've seen the legs, I've seen the head, I've seen the whole thing. There's our guys for now. Drink some water and answer some last questions before we go. All right, 
I couldn't tell the difference between not being interested in drawing a certain type of content and frustration with wanting to draw it, but not knowing how. Is it natural for that frustration to get in the way? Um, how can you tell the difference between not being interested in drawing a certain type of content and frustration with wanting to draw it, but not knowing how? Um, I don't know. You can't tell the difference. That seems counterintuitive to me. I feel like you'd always be able to tell the difference. Um, you're either into it or not, right? You either, you either think cool monsters are really cool and you want to draw them or you don't think they're interesting. You either, you know, want to draw happy dogs or you don't, you know, um, I don't know. I guess I don't under Maybe I just haven't experienced that myself. I can always tell whether I like the content of something or not. Um, and I feel like I, it's always quite clear to me that I don't know how to depict something, you know? I don't know. Maybe that's a more common thing than I think, but right now, both of those are striking me as like, yeah, counterintuitive or some sort of form of cognitive dissonance or something like that. Jiro Dean says, the piece you're working on looks pretty much finished to me. How do you know when to keep going or stop adding details? Um, I think it's personal. I know that that could be finished for someone else, but um, I just have a, I have a personal bar in my head of like a scale of detail and refinement that has just been built up over years of looking at pictures and finishing pictures and setting benchmarks for myself and being inspired. Um, that's what it's based off of. Um, I fully acknowledge that it's perfectly valid to say something's done at, you know, almost any point, really, once the idea has been communicated. Um, that could totally be done. It may be done, right? You know, I might just shelve these and never look at them again. Um, but um, the ultimate level of finish is, a, yeah, a, a sort of conglomeration of a specific level of detail and finish that I enjoy and that I can sort of envision in my head in a snap um, just from years of exposure and things like that. I've been enjoying attempting to sketch some of Michelangelo's figure drawings this month. Is this a waste of time? Not at all. Definitely not. Keep doing it. What does everybody love most about drawing? I love to draw without thinking about the contents, but just analyzing the line work by looking. Steven, your art inspires me to move forward. I drew three pages. Beautiful. Thank you, Samurai Reflections. I'm very honored to have helped you in your practice. It really means a lot to me. It really means a lot. I like it. I like that. It means a lot and I like it. And I like it and it means a lot. And when it means a lot, I like it. And the more I like it, the more it means. And it means a lot. And best of all, when it's a lot, it means it. And it's like, dang, is it meaning it right now? And it's like, man, now this is meaning and I'm floating and it's like, now now we're really, we're meaning it now. It's like, you like this? It's like, yeah, I like it. I like that it means that. And I'll keep liking it. It's like, whoa, mean liking the way all the way down to the mean likes. When you get on liking down to the mean, mean place, mean? Like it, brother. When his wife demands that he stops and pulls him away from the computer. There is an old artist saying that's something like that. It's like, it takes two people to finish a picture, one to paint it and the other to hit them with a hammer when they're about to ruin it. Can we get your intro again? Yeah, maybe. The middle design is crispy as hell. Yeah, well, you know, it's the third one I did. So, you know, you keep digging, 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 digging. I like this one for something ferocious it got a little loud you know maybe went too ferocious for ferocious sake but i like drawing stuff like that this one came out i don't know i guess because i probably got the ferocious thing out of my system on this one this one came out more sublime more about the plants i think it's definitely less ferocious looking than the other two especially because it doesn't have hands you know 
it might still be dangerous, you know, it could emit spores or something like that, but removing the hands, replacing them with something soft and floppy like that really takes away a lot of the punch from something being a villainous creature or a nefarious creature or something like that. His sick pumps also make him seem less dangerous, but um, they're super stylish. They look like some Alexander McQueen crap or something like that. <laughs> Dane goes and says, good night, man. Enjoy that cold New York weather when you take the dog out. Yep. I got something nice waiting for me in a second here. I've been having fun just doing the design stuff on stream. I did a past couple streams. Uh, I did like a biomechanical skeleton totem holding thing. That was a lot of fun. I always have fun doing just straight design stuff on the stream. This is uh, always a pleasure for me. This is really what you're watching me do here. This is what I have always done in my sketchbook since I was a little kid. The picture making stuff, like making complete pictures, I feel like that evolved later. Like I added that on. That's actually not my core natural process. Just this. This is what I was always doing in my sketchbook. It was just character, creature, object, one thing, isolated, focused, not about the scene, not about its interaction with the environment, just how well can you design the topology the surface, the nature of this one form and put it on paper. Rehearsing that over and over and over again as a kid, that's what made me go into design. And um, this is just an extension of that. It just happens to be digital and I get to do it in color because digital makes it easy to sling color. But this is exactly what I've always, what I owe, this is what my sketchbooks have always been. They're most natural. No scene, no composition, just can you make the one thing look cool? That was always my, my favorite thing to do. Omar, hi buddy. Did you reference that one on the right from the horrible evil spider I saw today? I had not thought of that, but it definitely did influence it subconsciously. I, I would not be surprised. Because it had those dark, long legs, right? Let me look at it again. This happens so often that I just know it must be real. But yeah, I mean, I had to have done it. I'll show the camera if anyone can see. Arachnophobia warning. Maybe you can kind of make it out. Nah, my exposure's all off. You can't see that. But, um... Yeah, I bet I added those black fang-like things to that shape because that was rooting around in my mind after you sent that photo. That's freaky that you saw it. That's too big. Five inches. Get that out of here. Persona says, I've been drawing for the past four months almost every day. I have been seeing serious progress, but all of a sudden I just feel really down and don't want to pick up the pencil. Just relax. Just take it easy. You don't got to force it. Make it easy on yourself. Just rest. Rest for a while. It'll come back. Creative urge will come back. It always comes back. Don't... It can be that simple, too. Don't embroider it. Don't make it complicated. Just give... Excuse me. Just give yourself rest. My pleasure, Aaron. By 12 till, by orange. Thanks, everybody. Do you have any tips on how to deal with ADHD? while trying to be a productive artist. I don't have it. I don't know anyone. I'm not very close with anyone. I'm not super close with anyone personally 
who has diagnosed ADHD. I don't think so. I don't want to talk out of my butt about something like that. Um, the people that I do know, who I'm not super close with, but are friends, uh, medication really helped them. I don't know. Take that for what it's worth. I'd, uh, I'd talk to a doctor, get professional help. Jose says, do you ever take a break from your usual work to experiment and learn something different like landscape or portraits or industrial design? Yeah, all the time. I'm always, I mean, yeah, you watch these streams long enough. You're going to see me. I mean, my God, I hadn't drawn cars in years. And uh, um, before I went on vacation last week, I was drawing cars again. I do all sorts of stuff. I just, all I really care about is form. And um yeah, my practice from the outside, my practice might to some people look like, oh, Steven does pencil drawings or, oh, Steven's a, like a digital artist or a designer or something like that. Um, or maybe you see me as both, right? Like, oh, Steven's a, a pencil guy who also does digital sometimes or you wait it different from the inside. It's just form. That's all I care about. That's what I really love. And that's what I'm obsessed with iterating on over and over and over again. So form works in everything you know sometimes i want to do creatures sometimes i want to do landscapes sometimes i want to do hard surface cars sometimes i want to draw fog smoke just whatever has got the forms that are tickling my brain at that time that's what i'm going to draw and i'm lucky that i have the flexibility to do that right if i was uh if i had more like career pressure or job pressure or something like that um I might have to stick in a narrower lane, but in the current period of my life, I have much more room to flex and um, spend more time doing these divergent things. jumped again Toof says I tuned in like 40 minutes ago and you've helped me draw a few sketches thanks a lot for your channel by the way I got ADHD and your ch channel helps nudge me a lot to draw with your zen narcissist way thank you I'm very glad I am very very glad keep growing in the ways of zen and in narcissism they're both very healthy for artists are you related to Adam Duff? no Oh yeah, our art, our art and arts and uh, talking styles. I can see how they're similar for sure. I think the body of Ferocious Guy kind of detracts from the parts I like, but honestly, Ferocious Guy might be my favorite just because of the face. Sometimes it only takes one good part. Why is it so much harder drawing two figures interacting than one isolated figure? I just don't understand why this destroys me. Portion mostly, I think. I think managing proportions becomes more difficult. Games by Mark Wolf says, Hey Steven, how do artists survive during economic crashes? Do they just hunker down and do art without selling anything? Um, I mean, in a really, I don't know, I haven't lived through, well, I guess that's not true. I, well, I wasn't a working artist during the 08 housing crisis. I was a working artist for um, coronavirus, but um, I was already working remote, so it didn't really affect me too greatly. You know, I was already working for remote clients and just doing all of my work from home. So I don't really know. Um, if art is how you make your living, you can't just hunker down and not sell it or do the monetized part of it you're gonna have to do what it do but um you gotta get ingenious and uh hopefully as an artist you're well equipped for that because any progress that you've made in your art as business is from you being kind of ingenious about it so you just gotta up that i would imagine you gotta duck weave find different ways to do it um there's not a lot of pre-made arcs <laughs> There's not a lot of pre-made markets for art. Um, most artists, when they find a market, they kind of made it. 
for themselves. So if you could do it once, you got to do it again. How do you deal with the pressure of organizing a portfolio for school? Don't just try not to worry too much about living up to their standards or something like that. Just try to do your best work. If you do really, really good work, if you work hard, you'll find a school that is a good match. You will. Thank you, Shady Dragon. Appreciate it. Squid P, very happy, very, very happy to have helped you out. I'm trying to sign off in a minute here, so I'm just scrolling through. Sorry if I miss your questions, but ask them on the next stream, something like that. Just going past statements or comments and looking for questions, questions that pop out. What is the best place to start learning from the very beginning? There is no good answer to that. It depends too much on what your goal is. Um, as an artist, I think generally you got to get used to very early on, you should get used to picking your own path. So step one, the real best place to start is write down your goals, make it write your goals, what you think your goals are as best as you can understand them in one sentence, five sentences, and then one page, right? Do all three levels. Um, and then doing all three levels will really make hyper clear for you what you actually think you want, what you're actually heading towards. It should not be easy. It should take you a long time to write it out. You should have to think about it for quite a bit of time. It should take a few days, I would say. So be very thoughtful about it. Be very circumspect about it. You'll learn a lot as you do that. And then I think you'll find that having gone through that process, it'll be much clearer for you to prioritize. Like clearly anatomy is very important to me. I have to go learn anatomy. Clearly values are very important to me. I have to go learn color, uh, uh, values. Clearly color is not that important to me. I can maybe push it for later. So prioritize in that way. Oh, you asked what is the best place to start learning form from the very beginning, not just learning from the very beginning. Um, this is going to sound very self-serving, but my video, Secrets of Shading, which I have on my gum road. That is my five-hour answer to that question. Steven, do you animate or have you tried to? A little bit, not much. I did like a couple walk cycles in my time and stuff like that. A um, couple things in high school. I've always been like a single picture kind of a guy. Um, yeah, I don't have a, rob a robust love for animation because uh, it starts to frustrate me that I can't make any single picture as good as, it, as I could make it, you know? And like I said, I love render. So anything where I don't get to render at all, it like, uh, really takes a lot of the fun out of it for me. Rendering is enjoyable for me. It's okay that you were late, Strato Volcano, because streams stay up. That's the truth. My pleasure, Martin. Follow your heart and mind. Does anybody need a print sold on Etsy or something? Are you selling prints yet, Steven? I have an imprint store. If you just Google my name and prints, you'll find my imprint store. Do the monsters have class or is the designing 
with uh, is the designing with class. It's automatically classy because it's coming out of me and I'm doing it in a classy way. All right. I am going to rest now. It's time. It's late here in New York. So, my dear artists, um, let me thank you for being here tonight. I greatly appreciate it. You're all artists of the first order, I must say. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And as you go forward in the world of art, and as you make more pictures and you put more things out there, just remember that you've kind of already pulled it off, right? By making anything, the ultimate part of the goal has already been achieved. The truth is that everything in life is hypnotizing people into not being creative, into not being artists, into not having the gall to claim that they are a creative person and that they have creative impulses and that they want to generate. So that feeling that you have deep down that has gotten up to a level where you will hold it close to your chest, that you will make it the secret bird living inside of your rib cage. That was the hard part. Everything else, the managing the career, the putting it out there, the improving the skills, that's all trappings. That's all extra stuff. Every time that you draw, every time that you put pencil to paper, every time that you output in the throes of the creative urge, the war is truly won. You did a wonderful job. You added something that should be impossible to the cosmos. There's no reason that drawing needed to work. There's no reason that we should be able to show each other images that mean anything to each other. There's no reason that dust on paper or flickers of light on a screen should be able to cast a magic spell on another person and make them see permanently, unchangeably, what you wanted them to see. Sometimes things that aren't real, that never were real, that never will be real. I mean, when you look at it, when you look at all the parts, when you look at it on paper, it really should have been impossible. But here it is, a given, granted, something that you can pursue if you want. What a miracle. Who cares if you do it well by someone else's standards? Who cares if it makes your dad happy? Who cares what anybody else thinks about it? Take advantage of the shot that you have to do it and enjoy it. Good night, everybody. The year is 87.039, new nonlinear time. It's been 50,000 years since Stephen Zapata's final art stream, but we still live in a golden age defined by the gifts his stream bestowed upon mankind. Faster than light travel, eternal life, Stephen cloning, and the keys to a truly galactic human civilization. My name is Stave Satipaz, a reminder clone of Stephen Zapata, an exact reproduction of his personality as constructed by an AI compiling millions of hours of his original art streams. By all accounts, I'm exactly like the original Steven's public persona, just more muscular, exactly as he would have wanted. I travel the stars on my light tracer, a dream of Steven. My crew is, of course, all clones of Steven. Some of my officers are reminders like me, but not all. Some are bio-clones, and yet others are aspectoids, clones who, instead of trying to capture his full essence, amplify a particular portion of the original Steven's personality. We've spent hundreds of years drawing, exploring, and philosophizing while snaking our way through the stars, spreading the good word of design. But we've had another, 
secret mission as we've cruised the cosmos. We, I, seek information on the legendary originals, Stephen Zapata's true drawings that he flung wide across the stars at the end of his life on Earth, never to be seen again. My crew thinks I'm looking for them for the same reason all the other madmen do, because they would be valuable beyond all reason. But they don't know what I know, that a critical mass of originals in the hands of a trained reminder can provide a psychic link to the original Stephen mind. Once I collect enough, I'll be able to fulfill my destiny and achieve psychological continuity with the original Stephen. And through me, he will live again to usher in golden ages of art forever. Drawing Ascendant, The Eternal Chronicles of Stephen Zapata. Lasting Legacy 1, Epic 1.